year of playing the increased minutes in the absence of Cam Fowler? Did he just have a horrible game? I don't know about horrible. I felt like he just wasn't – I mean, if you're talking about his offensive side of things, I mean, you can't really fault him on that play in front of the net where the puck bounced off the inboards. I mean, defensively, he was out there for one goal against. I didn't think he had a terrible game at all. I, I felt like the line that just got crushed, as we mentioned earlier, was that third pair. The top four played pretty solid tonight. I think they I think they did what they could. I mean, yeah. missing Cam Fowler is a big piece. I don't think Lendl had a terrible game. I mean, if Chase is in the chat, I, is there anything that you're referring to specifically? Because I, I didn't feel like he had an awful game at all. And I know that I love Lindholm, so it's easy for me to, like, pass by some things. But, I mean, realistically, I didn't see anything that was just – you know, under the microscope for me, I was like, wow, what the hell is he doing there? Yeah, I mean, five on five, Lindholm and Manson were the Ducks' best pairing. I mean, their Corsi 4 percentage was 58.82, which is which is a pretty good game. Uh, five on five, when you switch to all situations, it definitely goes down a bit, but that makes sense with the Ducks having six penalty kills in this game and Lindholm being a big factor in that. But uh, I don't think it was a horrible game, and I also don't think he was really feeling the pressure from playing uh, any increased minutes. I mean, he played just one second over 23 minutes, which is a regular night for him. And if you look at really who had increased minutes here, it was Boschman who played 21, uh, just over 21 minutes. And then you had Walensky and Pedersen playing 12 minutes, which is expected. So it was actually Boschman picking up really Fowler's minutes, plus uh, Montour playing a little bit more, playing 23 minutes as well. So I, I, I mean, I, I'd have to disagree with both statements, I think, because I, I think Lindholm had a pretty good game. You just don't really see it because the Ducks didn't win. Uh, I mean, he he's defensively in a lot, very defensive-minded, so a lot of what he does kind of goes under the radar in games, and then you have to look and dig into those stats to see what type of game he had, and I actually felt him and Manson did a good job in this game. Their stats just get kind of muddied a bit from the uh, the special teams play. And a one game sample size in the playoffs yeah. is tough. Even look, looking at Corsi percentages and all that stuff, it's we can get a better idea of how this is really going to shake out. I mean, I know it sounds bad because these series, you know, could end end in four. Although we hope it doesn't, but you really get a feel for how this how these players are going after you're about two three games in. I think just a one game shot, especially the opening game of a series, is always hard to judge. Um, so yeah, I I don't think it was terrible. Um, we'll get a better feel about how all, these, how all these percentages look as the series goes along. Yeah, I mean, it was a it was a pretty even game, except for that stretch in the second period where, of course, San Jose scored three goals. Uh, other than that, and it's 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 easy to say that and look at it and say, other than that, I mean, they played a pretty good game because there was no goals scored outside that stretch in the second period. But I, I felt like it was a solid game for the most part for the Ducks. There's just, as we've mentioned at nauseum on this podcast today, uh, just a couple of things they have to work at and get going and fix up for the next game. Because I don't think it's, um, you know, burn everything, start over, and get ready for game two. I feel like it's make a couple tweaks here and there and go off what was successful tonight and hope that it's successful in game two. Um, Put the puck in the net. Yeah. yeah. I mean, <laughs> yeah, the there's the a, <laughs> it's a simple answer right there. Put the puck in the back of the net. And they didn't get a lot of good chances in this one. Got a little bit unlucky with a couple posts, but... I mean, they've they've got to generate some better chances for themselves, and they've got to figure out. I think priority number one is figuring out how to get through the system that San Jose employed tonight, because they they couldn't get anything going because of that, and, and that's credit to San Jose and the way they set up uh, and and stifling the Ducks' offense. So we'll have to see how they go in game two. This question here by Drew, I mean, it kind of goes into that because he asked our thoughts on the lines tonight. Said Brown seems like a better fit for this series than for Matt. And then he agreed with us about it not being about Gibby uh, and more about the Lions in general. Um, yeah, it can't be about Gibson. That's really that's really tough, right? You can't really blame him like, anything on him on that. I don't even want to go on Facebook. I usually stay off Facebook after a loss like this. People just go crazy. Um, I agree. Brown seemed like a good fit. I felt like he plays good games when he's when he's in the lineup. We talked about it a little bit, Vermat. I don't know why he's in the lineup. I mean, yeah. honestly, I don't. I mean, I, I mean maybe a great guy. He didn't even guy. play center. He lined up as a left wing, and I feel like he yeah. was in there as uh, as that spare piece when you need to win a big face-off. You throw him in, and, and you put start him as a center, and then he goes off for an immediate change, and you bring on the guy who's supposed to be on that line. I mean, it's it's in my opinion, it's useless because, uh, I mean, how much how many more face-off wins does Vermette bring you over – over having Kessler out there or Getzlaff out there, or even if you have to have Adam Henrique. So say 
let's say hypothetical situation here, Vermette has to come in and take a face-off, an important face-off for Adam Henrique, who ices the puck. I mean, how many more face-offs does Vermette win over Adam Henrique? I mean, what, maybe like three or four on a nightly basis? And I think that's a Yeah, high. and like, honestly, it's like, how much does point? that really move the yeah. needle in a game? Yeah. I mean, just because I mean, the Sharks win the face-off doesn't mean they're, you know, of course they've got offensive zone time there, but it doesn't mean they're going to generate anything from that. And if that's the only reason he's in the lineup and you have a guy who we believe can contribute a lot to this team and Troy Terry sitting out of the lineup, I mean, what's the point? I mean, throw Troy Terry out there that immediately makes that fourth line have somewhat of an offensive threat to it. And then you have Derek Grant and JT Brown, who at least can provide something on the off, off, offensive side of the puck. I, I mean, why not? Uh, we've said that multiple times. I mean, now they've burned that year off Troy Terry's ELC, and he's been a healthy scratch for all but two games since coming up for the Ducks. I, I mean, it's in my opinion, it's a no-brainer to put him on that fourth line with uh, JT Brown and Derek Grant, or at least move him up to the third line and try and get something going on uh, with Henrik and Cash and bump Richie down to the fourth line. But, I mean, we probably won't see it, right? I, I don't expect it to happen. No, and to talk about the face-off thing with Vermette one more time, I was listening to uh, 31 Thoughts, the podcast with Jeff Merrick and Elliot Friedman, and this was a few, maybe a month or two ago, but they were talking about how there was a point in time in Anaheim where they just they made a play to lose the draw on purpose and then retrieve the puck and get zone time. Yeah. Like, that's a thing. Like, teams do that. That's a thing to get, you know, you just learn to lose the draw and you create a play out of it. So the fact that face-offs that we've talked about before are extremely overvalued, I feel like. Yeah. You know, having Vermette in there to win a key draw, and it's talked about on broadcast after broadcast after broadcast. You've got to win the draw here. It's a very important draw coming up. I feel like that's overplayed. Yeah. Um, if that's all your guy does and he can't skate and he can't shoot the puck well anymore, he's past his prime, then you got to put somebody else in. And like you just said, you just burned a year off an entry-level contract for Troy Terry, who's a prospect that everybody's hot on especially in this Anaheim fan base who's been looking forward to seeing him. And it's just disappointing. Maybe that's one yeah. of the changes that's going to happen. But honestly, I feel like it's going to be a Chimera or a Captain Canada. And uh, I, we're not going to see Terry. I, I, <laughs> for whatever reason, I just feel like it's going to be, okay, the kids didn't work out. Time to bring the veterans in. And I think that's what's going to happen next game. Yeah, and, and I think, too, is you know if – you have Vermette on the ice, and, and all he can do is win faceoffs because he doesn't really contribute that much offensively or even defensively at times. You know, even if you win that defensive zone faceoff, it doesn't mean you're you're going to get the puck out or you're going to control the puck. And if you turn it over, right. then now you've got a liability in Antoine Vermette out uh, in, in this defensive zone. Or even if you win it on the offensive side, you're five on four for a bit. If you decide to throw Antoine Vermette right to the bench, and if it's a long change. Then you've got to wait for another guy to get out, and you maybe lose the puck in the time that it takes him to get to the bench and get a guy, say, like Raquel, back on the ice. I mean, it, it rarely works. I mean, there might be one or two times where it works. We're having Antoine Vermette winning a big faceoff, uh, and then it leads to a goal or a good chance. But, uh, I mean, for what? Maybe one or two chances in the game, if that, if we're lucky. Uh, there's no point in having him in the lineup when, when again, we're going to mention, but when you have a guy like Troy Terry, you can put in there who can at least create some offense on his own. And, and then you have that ability to throw that guy on the ice and make the team a little bit deeper. I, I, I don't see why the decision was made, but I'm not surprised with it based off of what Randy Kyle has done this season. No, that's true. I mean, uh, oh, I just saw this from Gordon Bombay in chat. Yeah. He said, can we remind everyone that the Sharks aren't known <laughs> for holding a series lead? Ask the Kings and the Oilers. So, very true. Very, very true. But we got to make some changes here to get going in the second game. Matt asked the question, would you guys agree that everything looked like a struggle tonight? <laughs> I don't think you could say it any better than that. Yeah. That's just the kind of game it was, especially once the Sharks got the lead. I mean, oh, I would yeah. argue before it was pretty even, and the Ducks had their chances and couldn't and couldn't bury them. But once the Sharks had that lead, it was like, okay, shut down City. It's just what was going to happen in this game. Yeah, and I feel like it really portrays the offensive side of the game for the Ducks is everything just looked like a struggle. They struggled to get through the system that San Jose was putting up. They really didn't get any chances. I feel like the Sharks didn't get a ton of chances uh, on their own uh, offensively. I feel like they didn't generate a lot, and the stats kind of backed that up a bit. Other than the goals that they had, I mean, they, they were kind of flukes in their own right. I mean, the, the, the Burns one, there's not much you can do on that one. And then, of course, the, the Kane one's on a 5-on-3 power play where you're expected to score. So, 
I mean, I, I don't uh, I don't know how to sum it up better than that. You're right. I mean, it was just a struggle. It's a disappointing loss. There's a lot of things that, that can get changed up for game two, but it's it's not a nightmare. And going about Bray, I was going to bring that up before, uh, before you brought it up, saying how you know people get so down after a big loss, and you look at the Oilers who lost seven to one to the Sharks, and imagine how their fans felt after that loss, probably thinking that the series is over. I mean, you just got battered. Imagine how Flyers fans feel right now after getting battered seven nothing. Uh, by the Pens in the first game of the of the playoffs. I, I mean, they, they're probably feeling a bit down. They're probably feeling more down than us. But it's it's game one. It's game one. Hey, of that, the, that's of the how Ducks fans felt against the Oilers last year in Game Six. Exactly. Remember that? Yeah, that was an I'm, awful Game Six. After the crazy comeback in Game Five, they go to Game Six and Edmonton just gets slaughtered. I mean, just it's the nature of the slaughtered. playoffs. It's the nature of the playoffs. Every loss is is elevated in disappointment off the regular season because it's a seven-game series. I mean, losses are, are huge. So I, I get it. I mean, we're all disappointed right now. But, it, you know, it, this is a game one loss. There, there's still six games to go. The Ducks just have to win four of those six games. San Jose still has to win three to win the entire series. It's not like they win on Saturday and, and it's over. So there, there's still plenty of time for the Ducks to get back in there. And there's some encouraging signs from this 3 nothing loss. That looks like this uh, this thing they might be able to easily turn things around for game two on Saturday. Let's get to Matt's last question. He says, What are the three biggest reasons the Ducks couldn't even bury one goal tonight? I'll go I'll, I'll do one and you can do another one, then we can maybe meet in the middle on the third one. But for me the biggest thing was uh, going to the penalty box. Very yeah. undisciplined play. Undisciplined play with the Ducks tonight. That killed them. I think that was the biggest reason you take the biggest chunk of time out. Mm-hmm. Uh, for them to, to try to get a goal, and we all know their power play wasn't going to work on it. So for me, it was all I was all about the PK. Too many penalties. Yeah, and, and the one for me, as we already mentioned, was the Sharks set up today. Their their system and the way they set up to neutralize the Ducks' offense, neutralize their chances coming through the neutral zone. That there really wasn't much the Ducks could get going. So you couple that with uh, the amount of power or the amount of penalties the Ducks took. You're basically taking what they took six penalties obviously the seventh was taken with about five seconds to go so you're taking about 12 minutes off the clock being on the penalty kill you're not going to generate a ton of offense during that time of, of course the ducks ended up getting nine shots uh, shorthanded so they generated something but uh, that really takes a big chunk out of why you really can't get anything going what would be the third reason for you um, th- for me it was no direct like grade a opportunities from that home plate you know, right in front of the crease. Uh, it seemed like everything was more or less pushed to the side and off skates. The Ducks didn't get enough clean looks in front of Jones, and I think they're going to look to fix that problem on Saturday. Yeah, I feel like that's a product of the uh, the way San Jose was set up, too. I mean, they were really pushing everything to the outside. I, I, I feel like it's really the two things we brought up. If I had to pick a third, um, I, I would say, and it's kind of a cop but just how bad that third line played. I mean, they really got outplayed by the Sharks' third and fourth lines. And that's uncharacteristic and something you don't expect. I mean, that's the matchup we'd probably take, right, with this third line. You would want them to be matched up against the Sharks' third and fourth line and hope that they can take advantage of that, and they didn't. And they really got outplayed, and that's something that's going to have to change if the Ducks' offense is going to turn around for game two. No, you're 100% right. I mean, I'm not trying to promote my other show, but on the Puck Guys podcast, we interviewed Kevin Kurz, who uh, covers the Sharks, and he said, look out for Timo Meyer." <laughs> that yeah. was one guy he said. I was like, really? He's like, yeah. Watch out for that guy on the third line. So I drafted uh, Timo Meyer because of that today. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, I good. paid dividends already. He picked up an assist. <laughs> and he caused havoc. Yeah. That line was everywhere. Um, another thing I wanted to give a shout out to the Ducks organization, just real quick. Um, there's been just all kinds of outpouring support. Um, you know, for the, the humble Broncos up in Canada and for the small town there, you know, they lost all those kids and coaches and a trainer. And it was pretty cool to see what the Ducks did. I don't know if you guys saw it on social media, but uh, if you, you, they were able to bring in your, your sticks. You could donate sticks and lean them up against Wild Wing. The players all did it. Like it's the statue outside. And the Ducks were auctioning off all the players' sticks. All the proceeds was going uh, to help out the families in that tragedy. And all the sticks that we donated, that countless people donated, gets donated to the youth program uh, for the rinks, which my daughter is part of. I thought that was really cool. I just had to give a shout-out to the Ducks on that. I just 
the hockey community is amazing when there's a tragedy. And I know it's been talked about all over the place, but I think 